Please stand for a reading of the gospel. This is the gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verses 33 through 43. It can be found in your Christian text in your pew Bible on page 89. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we're getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Christ. You may be seated. Amen. Turn this noise thing on. Okay. Seems odd that our story today is actually the crucifixion story out of Luke. Seems a little odd, but there's a reason for that. I'm not sure what it is, but I guess there's a reason for that in the lectionary. Today is uh, Christ the King Sunday, so this does kind of speak to that, Christ the King. But I want to kind of work through the story, because there's some interesting little tidbits in this story. It's a grim story. Jesus has been led to the top of the hill... Um, it's called the skull. Uh, we also know it as Galbatha, um, which means place of the skull. We also know it as Calvary. Um, not, to be, not to be confused with cavalry, but to Calvary. And, but our scripture calls it the skull, the place of the skull. That's because the hill looked kind of like a skull, is what we are led to understand, and that's why it got its name that way. But this is the place where the Romans were crucifying anybody that opposed the Roman Empire. And they take Jesus to this place and put him on the cross. They put it up. And he's got a prisoner on each side of him in this story. And as he's put up there on the cross, they start mocking him. They start picking on him, teasing him, uh, mocking him. They offer him uh, vinegar, uh, wine vinegar. It's a sour wine. They uh, take his clothes off of him and they divide him up. They cast lots for his clothes. They mock him. They, they mock who, who, claim, who they claim him to be. Uh, you say you're the Messiah. You can, you know, you've saved others. This isn't, this isn't the saving of the soul they're talking about. They're talking about saving life. They're talking about healing. You have healed and saved others. Save yourself. Heal yourself. Get yourself off the cross if you can do that. If you're the Messiah, if you're actually the anointed one, they say, you can do that. But that wouldn't fulfill the prophecy. That wouldn't fulfill the Isaiah prophecies if he was to do that. So he must live this out. He must live through this. He must die through this in order for this to be as God's desire for it to be. That forgiveness of sin, that sacrifice. So Jesus on the cross, and there is no mercy for him. Everybody around him. We, we note here that the people were just standing by watching, but the officials were mocking him, teasing him, poking fun at him. And then we have the two thieves, one on each side. 
And one of them, well, first off, if we back up a little bit, Jesus, in all of this agony and all of this that he's going through, and yet he finds that moment of forgiveness even in himself. Even for what's happening to him, this most horrible type of death, he finds that forgiveness in himself. And he says, Father, forgive them out of their ignorance. Forgive them because of their They do not know what they're doing, and so forgive them for this. Don't lay any blame on them because they're just acting out of ignorance. They don't know what they're doing. How many times do we act out of ignorance? And this is, a, this is one of those things where God is telling us that even when we act out of ignorance, forgiveness is out. In fact, forgiveness is ours while we're still acting in our ignorance. But if we're acting in our ignorance, we must strive to learn. We must strive to learn the truth to be on the other side of that ignorance, to find the wisdom or the knowledge we need to find. And but anyway, in this story, Jesus forgives all those people who are doing wrong to him. He just forgives them. It's an act of mercy. It's an act of grace. How difficult it is that for us to do sometimes when people are doing us wrong, even in their ignorance, how hard is it to us forgive others sometimes? It is challenging sometimes with us, these human beings, to forgive others. Especially when we feel they've done us wrong on purpose. Even if they've acted out of ignorance, sometimes it's challenging to do that. But God, with Jesus right here in the story, his first statement on the cross in this story is an act of forgiveness. Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Stephen in Acts uses almost identical language in his statement of forgiveness. As they're stoning Stephen, he says, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Stephen later uses the same exact response that Jesus used here. Stephen asked for the forgiveness for those who were harming him. So, Jesus, so Stephen himself picked up from Jesus the words that he needed to say and forgive in forgiveness of those that were harming him. And as we move through the story, finally we get down to the two thieves, the two criminals. We're not exactly sure what their crimes are. I'm going to call them thieves. There's no really uh, statement that that was true. They could have been highwaymen. They could have been anything. We don't know. All we know is that the Romans decided that they needed to die, and so they were put up on a cross, one on each side of Jesus. And one of them mocks him, just like the soldiers, just like the high officials, he says, if you're really the Messiah, if you're really the anointed one, go ahead and pull yourself off of that. And while you're doing it, save us too. But the other one, the one on the other side, I want you to know he doesn't call him, oh great king, help us. Oh great master, oh teacher, none of that. He doesn't use any honorifics toward Jesus. Instead, what he does is he uses his name. He looks over to him, and uh, in, the, in the, the, the Hebrew that they would have been speaking, he would have said, Yeshua. Yeshua, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what is Jesus' response? And this is what's really beautiful in this. And Jesus' response is, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, today you'll be with me in the kingdom. Just today, you'll be with me in paradise. So, okay, well, what's paradise? We kind of have an idea of what paradise is. But you need to know that the word paradise is a borrowed word from Persia. They learned, the Jews learned this word while they were in captivity in Persia. The word paradise is the king's royal hunting grounds. It's like a park. It's a big area that nobody but the king can hunt in. There's never any danger. It is a protected, guarded place. This paradise word has then been moved from, in the, in the, in the Hebrew mind, in the Jewish mind at the time, this is the story of Eden. This is the garden. This is where Jesus says is, we're going to the garden. We're going back to that perfect place. We're going back to that perfect part of creation, is what he tells this, this, the, the other criminal, the one who asked for forgiveness, the one who asked for mercy. Jesus gives him mercy and tells him today, you will be with me in this place, in this beautiful place. You'll be with me in paradise. What does that 
tell us? Well, there's a couple of things this story tells. First off is that forgiveness. That Jesus, no matter what's happening to him, he forgives. He forgives those who are doing wrong to him. This is the most horrible death, and yet he finds forgiveness here. We also find the story as we move forward, also in this story is that grace. Is that forgiveness, there's that grace. There's the idea that God forgives no matter what, no matter what your station in life, even if it's at that last moment of life, which is where that thief was. He was in his last moments of life. All of his life, maybe all of his life, he's led this sinful life, this, this life outside of the law. Maybe his entire life, but here he is at that last moment of life, and he looks over to Jesus and he says, Yeshua, let me be there too. Forgive me, let me be part of this also. And Jesus says, you're there. You're in the paradise with me. Today, not tomorrow. No, the word is today. Right now, at this moment, as soon as this moment is over, we'll be there. You'll be there with me. And that, I think, is comforting to us. It should be comforting to us, no matter where we are in our life, no matter how close or far we are from God. All it takes is that last moment. That last moment. And I know a lot of times you think, well, that last moment, you may not be ready. You may not notice when that last moment is coming. That's kind of a warning to you. You should be always ready for this. You should be prepared. You should be in that forgiveness state. You should be in a state of grace. You are there. You just need to accept that. You just need to accept and understand that in your own life, in your own heart, that you are already forgiven. But in this case here, that man needed it in his own spirit. He needed to hear the words that today you'll be in me with the paradise. Sometimes we need to hear those forgiving words also. And so don't be hesitant about forgiveness. Be positive. Be strong about forgiveness. When, when the opportunity arises for you to forgive somebody, don't hesitate. Just forgive. Give them a hug and move on. And don't let these things pester and fester in your soul. And that's what not forgiving does. It festers in your soul. So don't let that fester. Don't let that disease hit you. Instead, be forgiven, be gracious, be as God desires for us to be. Forgiving and gracious individuals, forgiving and gracious human beings. Amen.